Okay. Do you want to? That gets me every time. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm easily jumped, but um, we want to scoot in a little bit more. Okay. Okay. So let's begin. Chapter nine, verse one. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. I'm sorry. Before we begin, I really want you guys to take note of all the players in today's section because there's a lot of them okay so um before we get in there is jesus and his disciples and the blind man blind from birth there's also the pharisees that come into the play there's also the parents and then there's also neighbors and so there's a lot of different characters that we read about a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different heart conditions. And you guys heard my prayer today. There's really a lot of lessons that we can pull out from each life. Um, so that's always a good way to start. Sometimes when you're sitting down to read the word is to just list the people, like who is in the scripture reading for today and what's going on in their life. Okay. So Let's now begin. And Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So this is not an absurd question. There was a belief that would take, that was rampant, that if somebody was born with a deformity, then there was sin, that the baby was actually capable of sinning within the womb or that the parents had sinned. And so um, while it's not altogether too far-fetched, you know, you think of our world today and women who are pregnant and sinning and using and how that does sometimes have an effect on the child. Um, this was a little bit different. This was, you know, because the, at the end of the day, sin is the reason for an imperfect human. Okay. Because prior to sin, we were made perfect. We were made in God's image. So yes, like sin ultimately was the reason, but that was a belief that was so preached in such a condemning way and was really far from the heart of God. And no person had sinned. The reality is that we live in a fallen world. And so there are some things that you are born with. Okay. Many people are born with imperfections and, um, you, you cannot control the environment that you're born into. That's something that is out of your control. Some people are born into single family homes. Some people, you know, single mom, single dad, some people might actually have some physical deformity. And so there's lots of different scenarios. You cannot always control your situation, but there is a lot that you can control, which is yourself. Okay. And so your responses, and we'll take a look at that. But the question posed was, um, who sinned? Okay. The man or his parents. I want you guys to see a few things about Jesus. First of all, about Jesus and this blind man. So we could write down that this blind man, he was born blind from birth. So he had never experienced sight and you could take a minute and just step into his life. And just think about that. Okay. He had never experienced it. I don't know if that's really worse than having experienced it and then have it taken away from you. Um, but he had never eaten a meal seeing, okay. Never got to experience facial expressions, which are a very important part of early childhood development and just humanity in general. He had never gotten to see the light or anything like that. And so he was not also recorded to be crying out to Jesus for help. What the scriptures say for us today is that Jesus passed by and that Jesus saw the man. I mean, the man didn't necessarily see Jesus, and we know he didn't physically see him um, because he was blind, but Jesus saw the man. And then, uh, so his attention was on the man first, before the disciples, before anybody. So is the case today true to the Lord's character is he always sees the person in need. And then his disciples are often drawn with um, their attention to the person. So 
Jesus answers and says, neither, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. It was nobody's fault is what Jesus was saying. But he did mention a purpose. There was a purpose for this man's condition, for this man's trial, for this man's deformity, his disability. There was a reason for it. And so Jesus answers and gives them the answer to their question in verse three, which was neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Okay. That God would be glorified through his life. So what we need to take from this is, is that our perspective on our trials needs to become more heavenly. Our perspective on our trials, we need to have Christ's perspective because there was a purpose to the suffering. And so you can know that always for any situation that you ladies have. Okay. There is a purpose for the um, suffering that you're going through. God does not allow suffering because he's a mean God. He is not a mean God and he's never to blame. Although he does make allowance for things in our life and we will do one of two things. You will turn to Jesus in your hour of trial, or you will not, you will turn to a man um, made thing, whether that's, you know, um, some sort of drug or, you know, shopping or any, anything that's a created thing, I should say, okay, you will either turn to God or you'll turn to anything created a person. And so um, we know that there's purpose and that Jesus answers and says, you know, nobody sinned, but this was done. So that got the work of God, okay, a work that God could do to be made manifest in him. I want you guys to know something else. When his disciples had asked him and said, you know, who sinned, we do not get punished for our sins from the Lord if we are in the Lord. And um, to think that now there are consequences to sin, and this is different from that. If you're going to make bad choices, then there's going to be consequences. Okay. Um, it, I'm not talking anything unbiblical like karma. I'm talking biblically like you sow what you reap. Okay. Or you reap what you sow, excuse me. And so, you know, there, when you are in Christ, then we do not get justice. We get mercy and we get grace. Psalm 103.10 says this. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Great. Thank you. The scriptures say he has not punished us according to our sins. Can you imagine if he had, if we were to get justice, what we deserve is far greater than simple blindness. Okay, like that is far greater than a simple blindness. Our sins deserve an eternity in hell, separation from the Lord. And the scriptures tell us we have not been dealt with that way. He is merciful. The very next verse after that actually talks about how merciful he is. So the purpose um, that... Uh, Jesus had for this man was that his works would be manifested in him. And so if we can come to the biblical thinking of our trials, our weaknesses, our insecurities, our struggles, they, they have a greater purpose than what I can see right now. So second Corinthians four seventeen, I gave that to somebody at renew. Um, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly overweighs them and will last forever. Okay, thank you very much. That's um, a great verse. And 
one that any of you who are going through any sort of trial, okay, should really spend time meditating upon because it said that our, um, it said the, the temporary struggles that we go through, okay, the light and momentary, sorry, that's what it, that's how it described it when Paul wrote it the light and momentary affliction. So I don't know about you guys, but whenever I'm in a trial, does it feel light? Number one, do your trials feel light all the time? No. Do they feel momentary? No. no. They usually, it's like, when is this going to end? When is this going to, you know, when, how long do I have to suffer, Lord? And it doesn't always feel light. So when you can gain the, po the proper perspective of your trial and when you draw close to the Lord, you know, Paul would write about his trials and say how worth it they were because of the fellowship of suffering, that the fellowship with Jesus that he would have in his suffering. And so only in Christ can you gain a different perspective. And what she read for us in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 about the light affliction that we go through and how temporary it is. And versus the eternal weight of glory. So I know things can feel heavy, um, but truly they are not. Okay. When compared to eternity, which we just haven't experienced yet and the weight of glory. And so he goes on here and says in verse four, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. And as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. This is the second time that Jesus refers to himself as the light of the world. And the first time was to the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. So he says, I am the light. He is the hey, if you will. Hey, which is H-E is the fifth letter of the um, Hebrew alphabet. And um, so he, you know, Jesus is the light of the world and this was the purpose he came was to give spiritual sight to everybody. And so at the end of our reading today, he addresses spiritual blindness to the Pharisees. So this man may have been physically blind, but remember the way Jesus healed him, he never actually saw Jesus. Jesus sent him away still blind and so later on, when Jesus comes and finds him and talks with him, he's like, and says, you know, do you know who the son of man is? And he's like, I want to know. He had not seen Jesus physically. So Jesus, Jesus's response to him was, you have seen him. So the man, although he had been blind, had received the Lord. And so Jesus is addressing the spiritual blindness that was taking place over the people of Israel, as well as over the Pharisees. So at the end, so he's saying that he is the light of the world. And he says um, in verse six, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man. I'm teaching out of the King James version. Yours might say something completely different. Mine says the word spittle. <laughs> so Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud, okay? Uh, made mud, made clay. And he anoints the eyes of Jesus. Now, I don't know if anybody read this and was like, what the heck? Okay, so we see Jesus speak a word and people get healed. We see Jesus reach out and touch somebody and they get healed. We see Jesus say, you know, go back. And they have to just go back to their home and their children are raised. Okay. Like we see him heal in many different ways. And this is good because the power of God is not in a method. And that is extremely important for us humans who are oftentimes trying to have some sort of method for things, but the power of God is not in a method and he deals with each person very individually. And he did have a way often, but we have this, we have two other accounts in Luke where he used spit to heal, but this is the only time he spit in the ground and made mud and put it on somebody's eyes. 
And maybe you're thinking, well, that was kind of mean. Doesn't that seem mean? Um, you should just know some things about God. God is not mean. <laughs> like there's things about the Lord. And so when you are sort of figuring things out and learning about him and reading the word, um, while it's true, he's not a mean God. I want to also say that God does not spare our feelings. The gospel is a stumbling block and it is offensive. It's a rock of offense. It does offend people. And so, and this is the way that Jesus healed this man. And would the man had gotten up and gone to the, um, where was it? The, the pool of Siloam. Would he have not have been as easily motivated had he not had dirt in his eyes, actually mud in his eyes. So although this seems strange or, you know, however it might seem, God actually helped him and motivated him to go. And Jesus didn't walk with him. Jesus didn't take him by the arm and lead him to the pool of Siloam. Jesus spit in the ground, anointed his eyes, and then said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, which is by interpretation sent. So he went there for his way and washed and came seeing. Okay. So the man listened to the Lord and he obeyed and he had a faith in action. Okay. Jesus took the, he, Jesus takes the initiative and in this whole account. That's what we see. But the man is still expected to respond in faith and obedience. So it doesn't matter that we don't have this account of the man crying out for help. Jesus passed by, Jesus saw him, Jesus initiated, Jesus healed him, and the man still had to obey in faith. And that's important for us all to know. Like, it doesn't matter if you really weren't searching for the Lord. Maybe you ended up where you were ended up. You know, you might not see it as it was the Lord. Um, maybe it was just certain circumstances, but God was trying to get you into a program. And at the end of the day, it is where the Lord led you and you're still responsible to have, um, react, to react in faith, okay. To respond in faith with the Lord and in obedience. So no matter what, now this guy couldn't say, well, I mean, he could, but it would have been wrong to say, but I, I can't. And what would have been some of his reasons for not being able to obey? Yeah, I didn't I don't have anybody to lead me. I can't see. It reminds me of John chapter five, um, just you know, maybe a couple weeks ago when the guy was outside of the pool and, and you know, the angel come down and stir up the water, and, and he had been there for 38 years, remember? And Jesus was like, Why haven't you gotten in? He's like, There's nobody here to help me. And Jesus ends up healing him. But like we can come up with many excuses. Um, why not to obey? And you should all know none of them are good enough. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. Jesus told him what to do and he needed to do it. And so this tells me that had he not done it, I don't know that he would have been healed. If it doesn't make sense, Lord, we have so like, I can sort of count on my fingers, like, you know, it doesn't really make sense or you know, that seems strange or I can't like, I, how am I supposed to get there? There's nobody here to help me. And so we know that the man went, the man obeyed, but we should go to first Samuel 15 really quick. Um, we'll go and we'll, then we'll come back to our reading. But if everybody could turn to first Samuel 15, we are not victims to our circumstances and the world that we live in today wants you to think that you are. You're a victim to your upbringing, the way you were brought up. If you were an orphan or you were in an abusive household or your parents were drug addicts or they were just unloving. Like we can always think about some reason why things were not perfect for us. And, or, you know, I used to get in trouble for this or for that. Like we can always come up with some reason why not to obey. Okay. But, but again, they're not good enough. They're not going to be, um, they're not going to be the ticket that gets us off the hook from the Lord. So in first Samuel chapter 15, this is something we just read the other day or yesterday, even I can't remember, but 
In verse three, first, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the direction from the Lord. Okay. Then we're going to look at the responses and um, whether there was obedience to the direction or not. So in first Samuel 15, verse three, here was the direction. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Okay, so please reread it. It's 1 Samuel 15, verse 3. This was the direction to Saul. God said, go and kill the Amalekites. Utterly destroy everything. Don't spare them. Slay man, woman, infant, nurse, so child, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Do you guys, does everybody understand the direction that was given by the Lord? Everybody, I see some people nodding their heads. So that was what God said to do. Now put yourself there if that was the direction God gave you, if God told you to do that. And do a little inventory of yourself and what would be difficult for you to follow through? What, which thing would you stumble over? <laughs> what one did you say? The babies. The babies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We can kill the men and all right. The ox, the sheep, the donkeys, but some of these would be difficult. So if we look at verse seven, eight, nine, and 10, then we read that Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until all the way to Shur, that is over against Egypt. But he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. He utterly destroyed all of the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse that they utterly destroyed. So maybe your version says everything, like what does um, somebody read their version? Yes, everything that, that was despised and worthless to them. This is to Saul. So if you look at what Saul spared, the things that he despised were the men, women, and children, <laughs> okay? Because um, he spared the oxen and the sheep and all that. And so what happens is verse 10 comes in 11 and 12. And so basically God re rejects Saul as king based on his disobedience. Now, you are no different than Saul had you killed Agag, had you killed all the animals, but spared the infants. Just because your heart is turned more towards something else, you would be no different than King Saul in, in your obedience to the Lord. You still would have been disobedient. So just because he despised these things and not these things, he did not fully obey the Lord. He obeyed the Lord partially. And, I, and you guys should know partial obedience is disobedience. You cannot obey half, halfway. Okay. So partial obedience is actually disobedience. Like that's not real obedience at all. So in verse um, 18, it says, this is what God sent you to do. And verse 19 says, you did not obey the voice of the Lord. And so then, you know, God takes the kingdom from him. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more that gets spoken there between Samuel and Saul. And in verse 23, it says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And so he had said earlier, it's better to obey than sacrifice. Because Saul had dressed up his disobedience with, well, we're going to kill them. We were just going to bring them all here and offer them to the Lord. So if, if you are, are trying to obey God your way, that is also disobedience. Okay. God said it clearly. 
kill them all. So they didn't. And then he dressed it up with, well, we're going to kill them all. We're just going to do it this way. And that is disobedience. Does everybody get that? So like if God is God, then we have to do things God's way and the way that God says. So when we go back into our reading today, you know, he, I, I want you guys to know that this family, we can gather a lot. I know we haven't read the entire section today, but this family lived under scrutiny and criticism. This, this is a man now he was born blind and that was a shameful thing in this culture. And so they lived under scrutiny and they lived under criticism and everybody knew it. I mean, the fame of him, he was known, you know, Hey, who sinned was the question him or his parents. And what that can produce that kind of criticism that you live under can produce, um, man pleasers, people pleasers. And it did. His parents were people pleasers and the scriptures record that for us today. So, um, you know, there was no excuse or no reason he couldn't say, but, you know, this is how I was born. This is how I've always lived. Like, how am I supposed to do this? So the world wants you to be bound by an identity that is not biblical. That's what the world wants for all of us. The world wants us to be bound by I'm a depressed or I'm a, you know, I'm a manic depressing person. I'm a, you know, I have ADHD or I'm just a drug addict. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm whatever. Okay. And so I'm bipolar. That's a popular one. The world wants to have us bound by these things and we are not products of our circumstances. Not when you're in Jesus, you are a child of God. Ladies, all of y'all are children of the Lord, your daughters of the King. And it is Christ that I, that um, you can have your identity in. And so you don't have to be a product of your upbringing. You don't have to be a product of the man that was in your life, beating you or treating you poorly. You don't have to be a product of your failures, your own choices and your own failures. Um, so this is such a beautiful story of that. And he goes on. And so he came back seeing, and then in verse eight, the neighbors, um, therefore the neighbors, therefore, and they, which before had seen him that he was blind said, is not this, he that sat and begged, like, wasn't this the blind beggar? And that was his label. That was his name. Like this is, isn't this the blind beggar, you know, um, Though, and another version says those who knew him as the blind beggar. So that's what he was known for was being the blind beggar. And some people were like, it is him. And others said, no, it's not. It just looks like him. But he's all like, it's me. It is me. I am that. That is who I was. So this is amazing because truly in Christ, when you come to Christ and Christ sets you free, and opens your eyes and gives you another countenance. It's very cool that you look different. You actually look different. And gosh, to have your eyes open, like if to be blind and then have your eyes open, gave this man an entire new look. Now, not only is he able to see, but you know, so his eyes are opened. Um, he's also able to see himself had he been disheveled before he's able to straighten things out. And so there's a lot that he's able to fix and to do and to even connect with people and expressions. And so he looked different and people are like, I don't know, it just kind of looks like him. And so too, when we come to Christ, you know, there is a different air about you and there is a, cause there's a different presence with you. And that is why. So there's a deep division about him is actually um, what the scriptures say. And, and, you know, so it says in verse 10, therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? Like, how did you, how come you're not blind anymore? So we watch this man's responses. Now Christ just did a miracle. He the guy even says, nobody's ever been able to heal a man blind. And so now what happens is 
there is this um, trial. The man gets put on trial, if you will, by his neighbors, by the people, and by the Pharisees. And so that's what we're about to read. And you can look at his responses each time and how his responses change. Just for your notes, those of you guys that take notes, his responses are in verse 10, 15, 17, and 25. Now he says other things in other verses, but those are specific responses to how did this happen to you, okay? So 10, 15, 17, and 25, and 33. Sorry, forgot that one. Okay, so the people say to him, how were your eyes opened? So he answers and says, a man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when I went and washed, I received sight. So that's, he just tells it how it is. This is what happened. This man named Jesus. So they said to him, well, where is he? And he's like, I don't know. Okay. He didn't know. He just obeyed God. Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees him that um, was blind, that had been blind. And in verse 14, it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Okay. So that was like a big no, no to do anything on the Sabbath. Um, so in verse 15, it says, then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I do see. Okay. So you see him tell the same testimony. This is what happened. Okay. So now the Pharisees are asking. And so in verse 16, therefore, some said of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keeps not the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And so there's deep division among them. And people will always be divided over Christ. It is why he came. He came to bring a sword. Really, peace will come on earth when Jesus returns at his second coming. Peace can be granted to those of us here that are in Christ. Um, but there is deep division over Jesus among the world. And so uh, the man is there. And so people are very divided. And in verse 17, they say to him again, what do you say about him that he he that opens thy eyes. And so now the man says he's a prophet. So what's interesting is with each inquiry, with each, um, you know, with being, um, you know, under trial by these people, it's actually bringing him to a place where he ends up knowing that he is from the Lord. Okay, that Jesus is from God. So now he says he's a prophet. This is what I think of him. I think he's a prophet. The Jews don't believe him that he had been blind and received his sight. So they call his parents that of him that have received sight. And they asked them saying, is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son. Like, yeah, this is my, our son and he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who has opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spoke his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if a man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. This is like so grievous to me as a mom. And so having lived under the scrutiny of many people's opinions, this is the parents I'm talking about. They lived under that type of criticism and scrutiny. They also had been in a synagogue where it was put out there. If you guys are going to claim he's this, that he is the Christ, then you're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. And so they want out of the hot seat. That's what these parents want. They just want out of the hot seat. And so this broke my heart. Because I just can't imagine not defending my child and not standing with my child. And yet people pleasing is such a deep root that it will cause you to be foolish. So as we already read in 1 Samuel, you guys, in 1 Samuel 15, 
um, that same chapter in verse 24, it had, oh, I lost my spot. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, Saul had said, I have sinned, I've transgressed um, the Lord and his words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul comes to the conclusion that he messed up. And one of the reasons why he didn't obey the Lord is because he actually obeyed the people he was supposed to be leading. He feared people over men. This morning, I believe it was this morning in the Old Testament, we see David actually be afraid of what he had heard, um, whatever town he was hiding out in, I can't remember, acting like a crazy man, right? He started clawing at the door and acting and pretending like, like he was crazy. And, and that was because he had heard the rumors and he feared. And the fear of man, you, you're either going to serve God or you're going to serve man. And that's what the fear of man word. And it, you, it's always a foolish. And so, you know, his, this life of criticism. And so, um, you know, they're like, you just ask him, they like put it back on their kid. And so just, he's of age. And so they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. Okay. And, uh, so in 24, again, they called the man that was blind and said to him, give God the praise, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. So his response is he answered, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know I was blind and now I see like, this is no. So they were actually helping this man form his testimony. He's like, listen, at the end of the day, I don't think I know. All I know is that I was blind and now I see, and that Jesus is the one that did it. And this is powerful. And that's all you really need to say. You know, it's all you really need to know is that Jesus is the reason for the freedom that we've be been given. And um, you don't have to be very eloquent or well-worded. You can simply say, listen, I was blind and now I see. And Jesus healed me. 26, then said they to him, what did he do to thee? How they open his eyes, your eyes. He answered, I have told you already and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples? I just am liking this guy because he's getting more bold. I mean, can you really even imagine never seeing and being born blind? And like, I would be so distracted. I'd be so over the conversation. I would want to go stare at the trees in the water. You know what I mean? Like there'd be so much I would be like taking in and just so overwhelmed by sight. And they are just all over him. All right. And, um, you know, examining him and cross-examining him many, many times. And so he's like, what is happening? Like, do you guys want to become his disciples? And they say, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he came from. And the man answers and said, well, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he came from. He's opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does as well, he hears him. Since the world began, it's never been heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So their um, cross-examination and all of this brings the man into further confession of who Jesus is. And so he is of God. It brings him to that place where he realizes. So they, what do they do? Well, they throw a dig. They're like, you were all together born in sin and you were going to try to teach us. And they kicked him out and he ended up getting kicked out of the synagogue. Okay. And so they just throw it in their face and they would do that. They did that to Jesus ladies and we're called to follow after Christ. And so if Christ was hated, we will be hated. And so you, you got to get used to being hated. They threw in Jesus's face that he was born out of wedlock. Okay. And so here they do the same thing to this man. They're just like, you were born a sinner. And 
because that was what, you know, for all of his years and his parents' years, they had to live under that shame of this disability. So um, in verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to them, do you believe in the son of God? So Jesus hears, you know, hey, that man got kicked out. And that is so cool. That must have been one of the best things that Jesus could have heard, you know, is that some exchange took place and this man got kicked out of the synagogue. So Jesus goes and finds him. Okay. He went and find, found him and he's like, hey, do you believe in the son of man, the son of God? And he's like, well, who is he that I might believe on him? Just remember, he had never seen the face of Jesus. He had had that exchange with Jesus before he had received his sight. And so Jesus says, you have seen him. And it's I that am talking with you. It's me. So he says, the Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He got down and worshiped him. And Jesus it says, for judgment, I am come into this world that they which see me, excuse me, that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said unto him, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. And so he was talking about the spiritual blindness that they did have. And so, and that is, you know, Jesus came to shed light, okay, upon the world and to teach of himself and to reveal himself to mankind that people would place their faith in him and be given new eyes, have eternal perspective. And so he addresses the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees. But that is the account that we have of this man today who was born blind and miraculously um, by the, by his obedience to the Lord and following direction was given his sight. And it was quite a testimony that it stirred up a lot of conflict. Uh, but there are some of the things that we take away from today is that we are not who the world tells us that we've been. We're not identified by the sin or by our weaknesses. And, you know, it was Paul that could say, when I am weak, then I am strong because your weaknesses, your struggles, your trials, those are the opportunity that God has to be glorified. And so they are a blessing. Those things are truly a blessing. Okay. So that is the study that we have. Does anybody desire to share online or is Peggy there that wants to? Say thanks. It's not. Let me turn the recording off real quick. Okay. Gosh, I can't find the button.